Chapter 4 of The Art of Kissing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Kissing by Will Rossiter. Chapter 4 Kissing in Different Countries in Arabia, Egypt, Russia, Finland, Iceland, Paraguay, a pleasing but perplexing Norwegian custom, the blue laws of Connecticut, kissing in the eyes of the law, money value of a stolen kiss, sanitary dangers of kissing, kissing the dying, famous kisses, the blarney stone, soulful kisses, kissing the feet of beggars. The custom of kissing varies in different countries. The Arabian women and children kiss the beards of their husbands. The superior returns the salute by a kiss on the forehead. In Egypt, the inferior kisses the hand of a superior, generally on the back, but sometimes on the palm. The son kisses the hand of his father, the wife that of her husband, the slave and often the free servant that of the master. The slaves and servants of a grandee kiss their lord's sleeve, or the skirt of his clothing. In Russia, the eastern salutation is a kiss. Each member of the family salutes the other. Chance acquaintances on meeting kiss. Principals kiss their employees. The general kisses his officers. The officers kiss their soldiers. The Tsar kisses his family, retinue, court and attendants, and even his officers on parade, the sentinels at the palace gates, and a select party of private soldiers, probably elaborately prepared for this royal salute. In other parts, the poorest serf, meeting a high-born dame on the street, has but to say, Christ is risen, and he will receive a kiss and the reply, He is truly risen. The Empress Catherine of Russia instituted assemblies of men and women to promote the cultivation of polite manners. Among the rules for maintaining the decency of those assemblies, she directed that no gentleman should force a kiss from or strike a woman in the assembly, under pain of execution. A most pleasant, tender, but at the same time perplexing salute is that bestowed upon one by the women of Norway, who, after having put you to bed and tucked you well up between the sweet-smelling sheets, bend their fresh fair faces and kiss you honestly upon the beard, without a shadow even of shame or doubt. In Finland, contrary to the usual custom, the women object to the practice of osculation. A Finnish matron, on hearing that it was a common thing in England for man and wife to kiss, expressed great disgust thereat, declaring emphatically that if her husband dared to take such a liberty, she would give him a box on the ears he would feel for a month. In Iceland, illegitimate and illicit kissing has had deterrent penalties of great severity. For kissing another man's wife, with or without her consent, the punishment of exclusion or its pecuniary equivalent was awarded. A man rendered himself liable for kissing an unmarried woman under legal guardianship without her consent, and even if the women consented, the law required that every kiss should be wiped out by a fine of three marks, equivalent to 140 ells of wadmo, a quantity sufficient to furnish a whole ship's crew with pilot jackets. In Paraguay you are by force of custom obliged to kiss every lady you are introduced to, though this is not such an inestimable privilege as one would suppose for there all the females above thirteen chew tobacco. But one half of the young women you meet are really tempting enough to render you happy regardless of the consequences, and you would sip the dew of the proffered lip in the face of a tobacco factory, even in the double distilled honeydew of old Virginia. Under the notorious blue laws of Connecticut, no woman was allowed to kiss even her child on the Sabbath or fasting day under heavy penalties. Only a few years ago it was considered remarkable that a Western magistrate should impose a heavy fine and a term of incarceration upon an unfortunate fellow who had kissed a pretty girl on the ears without her consent, but police justices in New York have quite frequently imposed the same punishment for similar offences that have occurred in recent years. In the eyes of the law, kissing a lady without her will and permission is a common assault, 
punishable by a fine and imprisonment. Someone of an inquiring turn of mind has tried to definitely determine the average money value of a stolen kiss in the United States. Court rulings show that the act of forced osculation in Pennsylvania costs $750, while in New York it is placed at $2,500. New Jersey, with a shocking disregard to the merits of the stolen sweets to be drawn from the ruby lips of her lovely lasses, puts the value of a kiss at $1.15. Kissing goes by favor is a trite saying, but the figures submitted indicate that the sands of Jersey offer the greatest inducements to indulge in this delightful diversion. From the medical point of view there is danger in kissing. The spread of diphtheria, it is said, is largely due to the practice of kissing children. It is hard to conceive of any mode of propagation more directly suited to the spread of the infection or more general in its operation. It stands to diphtheria in about the same relation that promiscuous handshaking formerly did with the itch. A physician, in explaining to a third party the warning he gave his wife not to let the children kiss any one, said, I tell you, it wasn't Judas alone who betrayed with a kiss. Hundreds of lovely, blooming children are kissed into their graves every year. There is death in a kiss. The beloved and lamented Princess Alice of Hesse took diphtheria from the kiss of her child, and followed it to the grave. Diphtheria, malaria, scarlet fever, blood poison, death lurk in the kisses. There are superstitions about kissing. There is a man living at Luray, Virginia, who became convinced when young that kissing was wicked because Christ was betrayed with a kiss. He resolved never to kiss anybody. He has been married twenty years, and is the father of eleven children, but he has never kissed his wife or one of his offspring. Among the quaint customs wherein kissing is involved is the surprisal of any person asleep by one of the opposite sex. In such a situation the drowsy party may be kissed with impunity, and must in addition pay the saluting party the forfeit of a pair of gloves. St. Valentine has also a good deal of kissing to answer for. The osculatory customs of this holiday are capitally and graphically illustrated by Sir Walter Scott in The Fair Maid of Perth, where the heroine kisses her stalwart lover, Harry, on St. Valentine's morning, and they afterwards exchange their betrothal gifts, prepared on such occasions with much forethought and circumspection as to their suitability and appropriateness. It was the custom among the Romans to give the dying a last kiss, in order, as they thought, to catch the parting breath. Spencer, in his pastoral elegy on the death of Sir Philip Sidney, mentions it as a circumstance which renders the loss of his illustrious friend more to be lamented, that no one was nigh to close his eyelids and kiss his lips. A little after he notices the dearest love of the deceased weeping over him. She with sunset kisses sucked the wasting breath out of his lips like lilies pale and soft. When Lord Nelson was dying on board his flagship, he took leave of his faithful friend Hardy by kissing him. Kiss me, Hardy, he said, and these were the last words he uttered. And so too Sir Walter Scott, when dying, kissed Lockhart, saying, Be good, my dear, be good. Many famous kisses might be mentioned. It is recorded in the book of Genesis that when Jacob kissed Rachel he lifted up his voice and wept. One of the funny writers has attempted to account for his weeping. He gives, among other reasons, that he wept because it was not time to kiss her again, because Rachel threatened to tell her ma, he wept because the damsel did not kiss him, he thought she was fast colors, and cried when the paint came off. When he lifted up his voice he found it heavy and could not get it as high as he intended. He wept because Rachel encouraged him to kiss her twice more and he was afraid to do it. Finally he wept because his first enjoyment of the most delightful pleasure of life overcame him. Duncan Mackenzie, a veteran at Waterloo who died at Algin, Scotland in 1866, delighted in relating how he kissed the Duchess in taking the shilling from between her teeth to become one of her regiment, the Gordon Highlanders, better known as the 92nd. 
the old Scottish veteran has not one left behind him to tell the same tale about kissing the blue-eyed duchess in the marketplace of Dutkill. There is a famous kiss in The Beggar's Opera. It was given by Macbeth to Jenny Diver, and the unpleasant effect which it produced on him may be judged from the sarcastic remark, One may know by your kiss that the gin is excellent. Petruchio gave his bride a kiss of enormous calibre. We are told that he kissed her lips with such a clamorous smack that at the parting all the church echoed. Tennyson speaks of the kiss given to Fatima by her lover. Once he drew with one long kiss my whole soul through my lips as sunlight drinketh dew. Margarita gave her lover a kiss which fact, coming to the knowledge of her husband, he gave her the troubadour's heart to eat, disguised as a savoury morsel. When Queen Margaret kissed Chartier, the ugliest man in France, she exclaimed, I kiss the soul that sings. Voltaire was kissed in the stage-box at the theatre by the lovely Countess de Villars. John Milton, when collegian, was kissed by a high-born Italian beauty and Stern, the novelist, says of kisses, For my own part I would rather kiss the lips I love than dance with all the graces of Greece after bathing themselves in the springs of Parnassus, flesh and blood for me, with an angel in the inside. Tom Hood once questioned whether the grave, sedate Hannah Moore had ever been kissed and Horace Smith, in his rejected addresses, affirms that on a certain occasion Sidney Morgan was playing the organ while behind the vestry door. Horace Twist was snatching a kiss from the lips of Hannah Moore. Everyone remembers the famous kiss imprinted by Mr. Bumble on the chaste nose of Mrs. Corney, and the still more famous kiss applied to the lips of Mary, the pretty housemaid, by Sam Weller. Sam had dropped his hat, which a housemaid picked up, and Sam kissed her. "'You don't mean to say you did that on purpose?' said the pretty housemaid, blushing. "'No, I didn't then,' said Sam, "'but I will now.' And so he kissed her again. "'Sam!' said Mr. Pickwick, calling over the banisters. "'Coming, sir,' replied Sam, running upstairs. "'How long you have been!' said Mr. Pickwick. "'There was something behind the door which prevented our getting it open for ever so long, sir,' replied Sam. And this was the first passage of Mr. Weller's first love. The custom of kissing the Blarney Stone is explained as follows. In the year 1602, when the Spaniards were inciting the Irish chieftains to harass the English authorities, Cormac McCarty held, among other dependencies, the castle of Blarney, and had concluded an armistice with the Lord President, on condition of surrendering this fort to an English garrison. Day after day did his lordship look to the fulfilment of the compact, while the Irish Pozzo di Borgo, as loath to part with his stronghold, as Russia to relinquish the Dardanelles, kept protocolizing with soft promises and delusive delays, until at last Carib became the laughing-stock of Elizabeth's ministers, and Blarney talk proverbial. A popular tradition attributes to the Blarney Stone the power of endowing whoever kisses it with a sweet, persuasive, wheedling eloquence so perceptible in the language of the Cork people, and which is generally termed Blarney. This is the true meaning of the word, and not, as some writers have supposed, a faculty of deviating from veracity with an unblushing countenance, whenever it may be convenient. The curious traveller will seek in vain the real stone, unless he allows himself to be lowered from the northern angle of the lofty castle, when he will discover it about twenty feet from the top with the inscription, Cormac McCarthy Fortis Me Fierifecit, A.D., 1446. As the kissing of this would be somewhat difficult, the candidate for Blarney honours will be glad to know that at the summit and within easy access is another real stone, bearing the date of 1703. In Blarney Castle, on a crumbling tower, 
there lies a stone above your ready reach which to the lips imparts it said the power of facile falsehood and persuasive speech and hence of one who talks in such a tone the peasants say he has kissed the blarney stone the famous soulful kiss given to fatima suggests the thought that such kisses are by no means new though in the present day they may be out of fashion in don juan byron speaks of such kisses as belong to early days when heart and soul and sense in concert move diagnosing such a kiss the poet informs us that on such occasions the blood is like lava the pulse is all ablaze and each kiss of that kind he declares is a heart quake in the time of herrick there was an anonymous poet who thus philosophized on the soulful kiss Philosophers pretend to tell how, like a hermit in his cell, the soul within the brain does dwell. But I, who am not half so wise, think I have seen it in Chloe's eyes, down to her lips from thence it stole, and there I kissed her very soul. The kings and queens of England in ancient times practised the ceremony of washing the feet of beggars in imitation of Christ, who washed the feet of his disciples. They washed and kissed the feet of as many poor people as they themselves numbered in years, and bestowed a gift, or Monday, upon each. The ceremony occurred on Monday Thursday. Queen Elizabeth performed this ceremony when she was thirty-nine years old, that is, she kissed the feet of thirty-nine paupers, after their feet had been washed by yeomen of the laundry with warm water and sweet herbs, and afterwards by the sub-almoner. The last of the English monarchs who performed this office in person was James II, in 1731, in his forty-eighth year. In 1530, on Monday Thursday, Cardinal Wolsey washed and kissed the feet of fifty-nine poor men and after he had wiped them he gave every one of the said poor men twelve pence in money three ells of good canvas to make them shirts a pair of new shoes a cask of red herrings and three white herrings and to one of them two shillings this custom is no longer observed but the poor still receive their gifts from the royal bounty End of chapter four